Good afternoon to everyone. Um, to those of you who were here last night, well, welcome back. Um, to those of you new, hello again, hello um, to today. Um, uh, and I'm very pleased to yet again welcome Michael Winterbottom to talk to us for, for an hour or so um, this afternoon. We, this session is going to be rather different to last night. Rather than having a simple question and answer where Michael's got to completely be under interrogation all the time, um, we wanted to do something a little bit more like a class, which is why we called it a workshop, um, where you get a chance. Michael said to me last night in the pub, you know, he's very happy to hear what you've got to say about his films more so than hearing himself. So we, we, we also want, um, especially for for the film students here who we've put on the front two rows, um, uh, to ask questions, of course, uh, to Michael, uh, but, but, but equally feel free to make comments about the sequences uh, 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 as well. We're going to try and draw out uh, and, uh, some little more details about film, film style, pick up on the things, some of the things we talked about last night, but also uh, a bit more detail about style. And I've got a series of uh, uh, sequences lined up that we, we can look at. Um, but I'm going to start um, um, with a more general question mm -hmm. to Michael, just to get things going, and then I think we'll have a look at it a, a little bit from a cock and bull story. Um, uh, so, Michael, hello again. Hello. Um, um, oh, we've got to say one thing, apologise on Michael's behalf, that the, many of the clips today are not of the quality that they should do. They're just facilitating this class. I want you to know that, Michael, this is not Michael's responsibility. Uh, this is mine uh, and the equipment I have. OK, um, uh, uh, Michael, um, I want to just talk about this improvisation thing again, because it's fascinating, this idea of how much is in the script and how much isn't, and, 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 and last night you were saying something really interesting that I thought people would like to hear about the trip, for instance, about how many pages there are for an episode of trip, and then how you then go about filling, filling that out. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think a lot of the films I do have got some element of improvisation, but it, it, it varies from, from, from one to the other. So with the trip, I mean, with Stephen Robb, I, I think like a lot of comedians, they're very capable of kind of of, of kind of like thinking of things to say for themselves. It's not like actors where, where it's very much kind of script driven. So with the trip, there's a kind of very, very rough outline. There is a kind of very, very faint story of like what's going on in their lives and what they think about the world and, and, and where they go and who they meet. And at the end, Steve's kind of by himself and Rob's uh, kind of happily back with his family. And so we had probably like three, or f maybe four or five pages per episode of just like things they might talk about uh, and uh, a little bit of background about uh, the places they were or the food or so on. And then, then really, we, once we started, they just they just uh, said whatever they wanted to. And you know, usually, what happens is, yeah, we're filming for quite a long period, so we film for maybe like twenty minutes, thirty minutes, and then stop, and then talk about what was interesting and what wasn't, if there was anything interesting in that 20 or 30 minutes. And then the next time around, they try and start with the interesting bit and, and then see if they can find anything new. So you sort of go over the same ground. And in the case of the trip, you know, the, the first uh, that series, what we did, we did, we did, we did like one tour of, of, of the North of England. Uh, sort of doing one restaurant a day. So we effectively did the, the real trip that they're supposed to be doing. Then we did a, one tour of the same journey, but doing the, all, the, all the driving stuff to drop the driving stuff in. And then we did another tour of the restaurants and did the restaurants all over again. So, so, so we were able to have a little bit of time to think about what they said the first time around and, and to do a rough edit and then to work back across it. So, that, so people like Stephen Rob, they're, very, you know, they're, they're really capable of kind of make, you know, feeling like it's fresh, but still going over. The, the same ground, you know, and uh, I think comedians like that. You, you, you know, whenever you see stand-up, it kind of feels like they're sort of talking off the cuff, and then you notice that, you know, if you see them a second time, it's exactly the same, you know, and all the kind of hesitations are exactly the same. And sometimes you even see them on the kind of chat shows, and they just do all the same jokes again as though it's them. So I think all that kind of background and training means those sort of people are brilliant at improvisation. I, I like the idea that if you see something you think's working, though, then you will push that and work on it for quite a long time. A bit like theatre people might call that, like de devised theatre. It's not just the improvisation, it will be worked on in some way. Yeah, I mean, you need to go over it. I mean, you know, it's, it's partly because you, usually like, one go, go through. I mean, on the trip we have two cameras, but on one go through you don't normally get enough uh, Kind of ways of cutting the material together that you can make it work, and and even if something's quite good, it's, you know, if you're improvised, if you're improvising, often it runs a lot longer length. So they might be chatting about something which is is quite interesting, but it goes on for 20 minutes, and you have to cut that down. So so you need to have a few goes at it to feel like you've got a way of making it work, really. You know, because the, the rhythm of it, you have to give that the rhythm a little bit later. Whereas obviously, if you have a script, 
in a sense, you know, that, that if you know that's what the content of the scene is going to be, then it's much easier to try and get the rhythm of that whilst you're filming it. So are there any lines written on, 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 on something like a script for the trip, <coughs> or is it just like we will be doing something like this? Are there uh, any actual, of, uh, di you know, where it says yeah. Steve? No, there was, there was it, uh, within the, I, mean, I think probably Steve and Rob would say, no, there weren't. There, I think there were a few, there were a few there'd be, but it'd be like starting points, yeah, because I mm. knew Steve and Rob anyway, so some of it was from just, you know, knowing them originally, and some of it was from sort of a couple of lunches chatting about the idea. And then we did, we did on, the on the first trip, we did um, like a two-day rehearsal, so we went up to a couple of restaurants in, in, in the area. And so from that, we then had some other things. But it's more like notes, like, you know, I, and also in particular, like, do this impression here, do this impression here, because they were not very keen on doing impressions. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, like, Rob's okay about doing impressions, but Rob didn't want to seem like he was always doing impressions. And Steve's not very keen on doing impressions at all. So it was a bit like, <laughs> okay, well, you have to, you, ha you have to do that. So was, that was probably the biggest note. You, you mentioned something while you were speaking about the two camera setup. Can you just explain that to everyone, what you're talking about there? Yeah, well, I, normally I, um, I, don't, I shoot on one camera. I don't really like uh, two cameras because normally when we film, especially, you know, it's kind of where people are improvising, the, the idea is the actor's free to wander around and the camera kind of has to find a kind of a way of going with the actor. So that makes it very hard to have more than one camera in the room because if you're not careful, you just turn around and, or, you know, the other crew is in your shot. Uh, so I prefer to work with one camera, but in the case of something like the trip, uh, I think you know, it's very static kind of uh, setup because they're either basically sort of sitting at a table having lunch or they're in a car. It's not a very complicated setup, so it's easy to have two cameras there without getting in the way, and it means that Stephen Rob, you get the, the response. So, so if they, they are, if they do find something funny, you have the response to, to what, what's being said, you know, in one go, which makes it more natural. And also, they hate eating too much food, so it means they have to. It means that if you're seeing both of them eat. Yeah, that they that they it means you half the number of times they have to eat the food, so it sort of has multiple benefits. Okay, um, let, let's have a look at this um, this sequence from uh, get rid of this slide that everyone must be bored of now. Um, let's um, let's look at this sequence from a cock and bull story because I'm interested in asking you specifically, like, with the script here, how much is is Steve Coogan doing, and we can maybe talk about this sequence more generally. Let's. Uh, so in that, for example, I mean, is 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 Steve Coogan making those, th those are like the little gesture about, oh, like they made me eat it, and those sort <laughs> of, uh, where he sounds very Mancunian. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a mixture, and it's, to be honest, it's hard to remember kind of afterwards exactly how things happened. And with, with, with a Cock and Bull story, it's based on, you know, the, it's based on uh, Tristan and Shandy, and so the, the, originally we had scenes, we worked on scenes, the, the kind of the scenes from the book, so the big film begins within the kind of book, and goes back and end, ends in the book. And we sort of, there was a fairly tight script on those scenes. Well, not tight script, there was a script on, on those scenes. Uh, and originally, kind of, I said to the financiers that we should, that basically we should just improvise the whole of the stuff of Steve in, as Steve. So, that, so that we had like a kind of half page of like Steve steps out offset and, and, then, and all the things that happened to him, like his wife comes up with his kid and he's got newspapers after him because he's been with strippers and so on. So, so, so we had like a half page just description of the events of that evening. But the financiers were like, well, we, won't, we, we want a script. We won't, we won't allow you to do that bit improvised. Uh, and so we then wrote a script. Um, but it was really kind of, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of, so I guess you know, we would have had, it had some of the things in it that you saw there, not all of them. So we wrote a kind of basic outline of, of what happens to Steve in the modern section. And then, and then, uh, and then we, got, we were able to get the money on that basis. But I mean, when we started filming, we start, the first week of the filming was all the period stuff. And I think you know, there's a big difference between period and, and you're know, talking about improvisation, between period and, and contemporary. It's a huge difference. It's very, I think it's very hard for actors to improvise in, in, a, in a period situation. They just don't feel comfortable enough with their character or their language. So it was quite a frustrating, it wasn't frustrating for a week where it felt a little bit like tied down by the script. And then we had a rainy day. And, uh, and because it was raining, we, we just went into the makeup truck and we just sat down and Steve and Rob did just chatted random chat about it in the makeup truck, which then became the opening scene of the film, them sitting in the makeup truck wait, waiting to go on. And that was sort of totally improvised. So, so in that film, that was, the beginning and the end were both totally improvised, because at the end of the film, we like showed the, the film to them and then we got them to chat about stuff at the end of the film, which is also totally improvised. So it had that stuff, it was just them sitting talking. Uh, and talk, uh, yeah, talking about themselves. And, and then in this area, you've got a bit of a mixture. So for instance, at that point, I think there's a re reference there to the shoes, and Steve's saying about his shoes not being uh, tall enough. And uh, that was something that Steve suggested. So it wasn't in the script, but he suggested it sort of, I don't know, before we started filming. So then we had a whole little sequence of him being 
obsessed about being taller than Rob, making sure it was, and that was from Steve. But it wasn't like it wasn't like done on the spot. It was like it was yeah. a suggestion that came out at some point during the filming, and then yeah. we built the scenes around it as it went on. <laughs> so obviously there are things that you have to be organised about. You know, if you want to talk about sort of the heels, for instance, on the shoes, which is what that refers to. You obviously have to have shoes with the heels. You have to make sure all that is is prepared. So, so those sort of things are like maybe improvised in detail, but you have to you be prepared for them. Whereas if they're just sitting talking about at the beginning of the film, they talk about the colour of Rob's teeth. So all that was able to do that naturally because Rob naturally had yellow teeth, so it was easy. That's good. That's and good. then by the end of the film, he'd actually had them whitened, so at the end of the film, he was able to show Steve how white they were now compared to how yellow they were at the beginning of the film, which was, again, was natural, was real. We, 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 talk, we introduced last night the, um, the, 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 the idea of your, the style you use a lot of, uh, of like the documentary or the coverage thing, and I was just thinking here, um, this is where the, 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 I don't know, the improvisation meets the style in a really nice way because if you look, it, it, he does this wonderful look on them, which he's not, he's not directly the object here, you've sort of got the main action and, and he's looking at that look that Steve Coogan's doing um, uh, there and, and, and so and then things caught like that but they're quite quick and you can, you can miss them. Yeah, I mean I think in particular that point of the film that's when they've just stepped off the set, so obviously you know, you, because you've been in the peer film, the, the, if, I guess partly it feels like the more, uh, the more you can make that break in the, in, the, in the style of filming and the kind of the, the rhythm of the acting in a way, the better. So I think that that's probably particularly kind of, uh, kind of particularly kind of messy feel to it because it felt like it was okay because you want to you want to just have a different texture at that point of the film to to, to clarify that texture. Right. Then probably as it goes on, it kind of gets a little bit more organised again. Right. Yeah. But obviously but the performers. I mean, the performers. You know, it's a, you know, they're doing. Because the set is quite chaotic in general, like, you know, because we try not to rehearse too much and try and keep everyone else offset. So it's really just the people with the camera who are kind of following them around. So it's, and because they know they can improvise and they know everyone else can improvise, so they're having to keep a lookout for what's going on. And, and therefore, you know, therefore each time they do it, it's slightly different. And they're trying to they're trying to work out what's happening, where the camera is, not sure where the camera is going to be. So it means that naturally they're acting in a slightly different way to, the, to if they know this is their close up. This, this lo I'll open it out in a moment. This location is really good as well because there's not a, there's not a marked thing between where the film's taking place and where they're hanging about off set. So it's like this could still be a scene in the film. In fact, this might be a, a, a room in the... So it's, it's real... In, re in the film you're made, in the Tristan and Sandy film. So it's really... This, I really like this sequence because they don't go to a different place. It's taking place all in the same area, which blurs the lines even more between the fiction and the... Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah I mean, that's true. I mean, uh, I think also part of the way uh, we try and film is, is to try and uh, have some of that in, 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 in the reality of the film. In that, yeah, we, we tend to be as small crew as possible. Usually, you know, it, it's in the sort of, you know, it's, it's on location. And yeah, I think compared to a lot of films, you know, a, lot, a lot of films, obviously, there's a lot of time setting up, and then the shot's all set up, then you're doing this sort of, this particular section of dialogue, and then once you've got that, you turn around, you do the reverse, and so on. So it's like the, the, the bits of filming of the day are quite small, and there's a lot of kind of waiting, and then it's, that's the moment, that's the key moment, and you're filming that way. And then obviously the film, you know, it feels like that, because you f have these sense of these moments being, this, you know, the sort of very structured and very organised, and you know exactly what's going on. Whereas we tend to shoot kind of all, as much as possible. So in a course of a, we only do an eight hour day, but, but in the course of an eight hour day, we might be f turning over for like four hours. So whereas the actors are normally kind of offset waiting, they come on and do their moment. In our set, it's more like they're hanging around on set and we're filming quite a lot of time. So that the rhythm of the, rhythm of the filming is very different. And hopefully, from my point of view, hopefully the difference of the way we film it comes into the film. You feel that in the, in the film itself, you know. And for, certainly from the actor's point of view, they have to work a lot, you know, they're working, they're, there's, a, there's a much more subtle shift between being, be, be acting and not acting because oh, yeah. we don't have, you know, clapperboards, we don't have lights very often. Usually it's not a boom mic, it's just radio mic. So it's hard to tell whether you're actually in the film filming or whether you're just resting before you start right, again. Right, that sounds really good. Does anyone have any, uh, anyone want to make any comments on this sort of thing we've been discussing or this sequence that's come up that, 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 that Michael or I haven't mentioned? Okay, so, so people here, are people here wanting to make films or TV? Is that the motivation for doing the course? No. <laughs> yeah. That's too profound a question. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, on, on something like a scene like this, where people are, are just kind of going for it, will you ever say, can we do another take of that improvised, but, you know, change the tone? Like, do you, do you uh. direct... Do you, do, you, do you ever say, let's do another take of that improvised... Hit the same point more or less, but make it dark at the end or make it light at the end. 
Um, yeah, we'd definitely do, we'd be doing other takes, and you definitely would, you know, so you'd definitely like have a go. As I say, I, I don't really like to rehearse too much, so, um, so there wouldn't be a huge amount of discussion about the scene beforehand. Obviously, you have to have a you know, rough discussion so people know roughly what's going on. And then, if, if you're going to get, you know, you, you go again, I mean, personally, I prefer, I prefer to not tell people too much about why we're going again. I think if, for me, it's like the, a lot of the times, the difficulty for actors is they're too self-conscious about something to do. They want to emphasize something too much or, or they want to please you too much. So if you give a small note about something, it then suddenly becomes kind of, you know, hugely inflated the next time they do it. So I think it's easier to not tell them why you're going again and try and change things in the way the camera is happening or just change, sometimes just changing the physical space of where people are doing things kind of, kind of changes their performance. You know, then obviously occasionally give them particular notes. But I think if you say to them, you know, make it darker, make it lighter, that would be a difficult, that would be a hard kind of note to give them. It's more like yeah. stand over there, you know, or, or just, well, let's, just let's go again and try and put the camera somewhere else. I think in general, if you, you know, it's your, my job as director to try and create an atmosphere where they're doing it kind of roughly how I think it's interesting, you know, rather than trying to teach them how to deliver a particular line or, you know, to deliver a particular performance. I mean, to be honest with you, in terms of how it is directing, it's like, it's like, you know, I think everyone else on set, I didn't think so, but everyone else on set thought Jamie Northam was acting the way that I act when I'm a director. So, like, him as a director in the film, according to them, was kind of how I am normally, which is quite incoherent and mumbling and just wandering around with a monitor and not doing very much. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow it all... <laughs> Any other points on this? Bandit. I was just going to say, um, within the story of the film, the, the designers, particularly the costume designers, are bullied and reduced to tears. <laughs> I just wondered if you talk about how, you, um, how you, you privilege the performance. How important is mise-en-scene and the, and the space which they're performing within to you? Well, I mean, it is important, but it's, it's no good pretending if you're going to do a lot of improvisation and handle the camera that it's somehow the same as if you're kind of making a film which is incredibly organised, where, where, you know, where, where, where you kind of feel like it's incredibly important what lens you're on or where the person is in relation to the other person's on. But I think, nevertheless, it's, it's, I mean, obviously, as you're filming it, you're trying to think about the relationship between the, the camera and the actors and how best to kind of place the camera relation to the actors and the actors in relation to each other. So, I mean, but for me, it's like, you know, it, it's, I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's about a kind of mood or a tone rather than the actual, actual visu, visu, visual conception of the shot. It's not like this is the shot. You, know, you can't do that if you're working like this. But obviously what you, you're thinking about is, is how, the, how you know, the, 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 the rhythm of the, of the sequence in a way and, and in a sense of the, the kind of tone of the sequence, which is partly down to kind of that idea of like where, where the space of the film. But it's, it's much more, you know, you, you're having to make it, you're having to improvise it as you go along. And then obviously what you have is a lot of material. You have like more variations of material this way. So you, you, rather than having one script, which is done a lot of times, you have like a lot, a lot of different versions of scenes and so on. And, and a lot of different, you know, types of material, you know, where the camera is in relation to people and where they are in relation to, to, to each other. So a lot of that kind of structuring that is done in the edit, really, because you you're have still obviously still making those decisions, but you're making them after the event, sometimes rather than before the event. And the same with the script, in a way. Obviously, we have, in this case, you know, we had a script with this, but equ equally, you know, it's, like, it's a much more flexible script, so you're making more decisions about the content of the script afterwards in the edit. And I think editing and, and script writing are essentially two, two parts of the same process. I, just, I, mean, I was very interested in the film, the use of the prevalence of mirrors and frames and door frames, and that seemed to be brilliant in terms of the film's self-reflexivity, but also as a reflection on the novel's self-reflexivity. I mean, we've got a wonderful image there, but I wondered how, I mean, then, then, then well, you mentioned the Zonsen, and I wondered how conscious that was. Well, I mean, it depends, it depends what you remember me as I was saying. I mean, if you're talking about the kind of, I mean, obviously the, the location gives you quite a lot. So I like working on locations. Obviously, so as you're choosing locations, you're giving a lot, you know, a lot of you know, the sense of the look of the film. You know, it, you know, obviously with the designer, with Marcel, the cameraman, you spend quite a lot of time talking about the overall kind of tone of the film. Afterwards, you spend weeks kind of like trying to make sure that you feel the colors are right and so on. But what but was it? But, but in, in the say in relation to this, you know, obviously we, we probably had a rough conversation about okay, you're going to come through here. This is going to happen here. This is going to happen here. So we we sort of have a rough setting of like how the scene works within that location. You know, obviously in this particular case, you know, the, the, I think the key thing we decided here was like at the beginning, the set is like the wall is actually taken out of the set, and then you walk through as you say to a set which is essentially the same. But we want you know that idea of the set is a built within a location which is that is the same as the set. It's something that we like. So all the, you're obviously having all those decisions, but that's still giving you a rough idea. It's not like okay, we didn't like have a kind of pre-pattern like you've got to be in this. You know, this is the way the frame where you do this dialogue. That is something that you're you're as 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 you feel like you settle down. We probably did this. I don't know. Like 
10 times, 12 times. So as you settle down into kind of rhythm and shape for what's happening, they say, okay, well, you know, let, let's bring, you know, what, then you start working on the camera moves and where the camera's going to end up. And for me, it's like the way the camera moves in relation to the actors is, is probably more important than the individual kind of static frames about what the frame looks like. And where the camera is in relation to the people in the film. I mean, in general, I'd say most of the time it's, it, it's wanting the camera to feel it's right in that world with them and it's right, ne you know, right next to them. So we, because we're handheld and because of where we shoot, we tend to be much closer to the actors than you would normally be on a, on a film where you'd be a little bit further away with longer lenses. And what about the scene in Cock and Bull Story where you have the crew sitting around no longer knowing what the film's about and then you have this academic in the cutaway scene, was that already in when it started? Yeah, most of most of the most of the like when you, so if you're talking about things like well, you know, um, obviously most thing, most things in a film you have to prepare for. So like so so yeah, I think at the beginning you know I, I can't. I mean, do you mean when we see Stephen Fry up in the in, in the house? Yeah, no. So that was always planned, you know. But and the exact detail of what he said probably wasn't planned, you know. So so in the, if it's the thing with Stephen Fry, so you know, it's, it was like. Uh, I'd been to, when we started the idea of making the film, I went to the house where Lon Stern, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually the house he bought after he'd done the first two books of Tristan Shandy. So he wrote the sort of rest of Tristan Shandy in that house. And that's now a kind of museum, a kind of creative writing museum. And so I went there and so, so the guy who runs, curated the museum showed us around the house. And I thought, okay, this would be fun to bring that into the film. You know? So we were, you know, so you find things along the way and then, you, then obviously you, you try to incorporate them. It's not as though when we, wrote, we sat in a room and wrote a script, which I had that in, but as we were working on the film, we thought, okay, this, this, we saw the museum, the guy explained it, and we thought, okay, that'd be quite funny to have that in. And then we thought it'd be quite funny if Stephen did it, because Stephen Fry like, could extemporise in that area, and, and that, but then also kind of could play Yorick and it kind of felt quite nice that as Sturm as a vicar. Uh, there that would make a kind of like thing that he's then acting, he's both the academic and also Yorick in the film. But these are just things that feel like, okay, that'd be fun to do, you know. And it felt like, it, it felt like in that case that anything that felt fun to do, messing with the kind of storytelling or messing with the kind of play between Steve and, and, and the characters in the book or, or between the filming and the writing, that, that was all in the spirit of the book. And when we finished the film, the first time we showed it was, was up there, it was in the... That, that village, and like half the audience were Tristram Shandy experts from various universities around the world who were on some course, London course, and, and the other half were the people, local people in the village, and we showed it in the village hall. And it was great, because all the Tristram Shandy experts were like, you know, they really liked the fact that it wasn't a film of the book. You know, whereas if it had been a Thomas Hardy book and a Thomas Hardy experts, they probably would have hated the fact that it wasn't a film of the book. Uh, <laughs> different type of fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, Michael, should we uh, uh, should we look at the two bus sequences we said? Before uh, yeah, yeah, kind yeah, of. Quite yeah, long it sort of goes on from some of the things we've been saying. But um, um, <coughs> um, let me just uh, find it, find them. Um, I need to. Uh, Michael, I was wondering yeah. if, if you could talk a bit slower. As an online just speaker, I can difficult. Uh, I will try. I will try. Am I talking quickly? I will try and talk slowly. Um, we've got two sequences here, both on buses from different films, one from In This World and uh, one from uh, Welcome Sorry Over. And let's watch them both. And then Michael's got some things to say. But do you want to just slightly introduce the point, Michael, for people to well, watch out Yeah, for? I mean, I, I, this, the, we, cause we're, only because we were talking yesterday about kind of non-professional actors and professional actors and, and, and uh, what difference that makes and what, what is the different way of working. So th these are two scenes, but it's essentially the same scene. So yeah, I'm trying to make sure they're not too long so that we get boring having the same scene twice. What, one is, so one, one, they're both scenes where people are pulled off buses, uh, uh, but one is with, one is in Iran with a kind of non-professional actor doing it and uh, a whole set of non-professional people doing it. In a, so, uh, so it's uh, more natural perhaps. And the other is with actors and therefore more dramatic. And, it's, it, and in a way they're both trying to do the same thing in the film but it's just the different tone you get between using kind of non-professional or using actors. Great, okay, let's what, which would you rather I played first? Uh, probably the uh, In This World one. Okay. But you might, might just check where it starts, it probably starts very early. Yeah, sorry this song. I mean, I, I, I just thought, because obviously in some ways the differences between those scenes seems quite subtle. In other ways, they are the kind of exact opposite. Yeah, I mean, the, the, in the case of the first one, this world, it is a fiction film. It's not, it's not, it's, it was, you know, it's obviously based on, it's telling a sort of story that happens in, in real life, just like most fiction films do. But that's still essentially a totally f fictional film. On the other hand, everyone in, the, in this world is a non-professional. So the two guys uh, on the bus are pulled off are two Afghan refugees that we, that, that we cast in, who are from a refugee camp in Peshawar, or from living in Peshawar. 
they've been li living as refugees there. And then we, we organised a journey for them and they sort of responded as they sort of felt right. The guy pulling them off the bus is, a, is a genuinely the guy who runs that checkpoint and, and that's what his job is to pull uh, Afghan refugees off buses. And so he, so he was like, I want to do this, I'll, I'll just do it how I normally do it. And he did what he did. On the other hand, the second one is actually based on real events. It's based on, obviously, based on the war in Saudi Arabia, but more particularly it's based on the case of Michael Nicholson, who wrote the book, which this was based on, who cooperated with us on the film. But it's a slight fictionalised version of a real story. So he did bring out a, a girl who was adopting there, which is the girl in the, uh, on the bus that you saw at the, at the end there. And, and some specific, and this is like where, where the militia are pulling off Serb children, which did happen. There were real incidents where these happened on buses uh, of refugees leaving. And a couple of the images, like the guy running behind the bus, and I think the guy, image of the baby like being taken off, were images that were recreated from news footage. So some of the images of new, real news footage, some of our recreations of particular images from news footage. So, so in a sense, it's both more fictional that, in that you have a lot of actors, a lot of very well experienced trained actors like Stephen Delay, Marissa Tommy, J Jimmy Nesbitt acting, and therefore you have a different style of acting. And you have, but you have like a, you have both kind of more fictional things. It's more acted, it's more scripted, it's more dramatic, but it is based on real events. Or you have a more observational kind of style with non-professionals, but as a fiction. You know, just thought there might be, you know, kind of interesting kind of to think about the differences. It was very interesting that in the first one it seems the emotional tension which was later created in this one in, uh, uh, through the acting was incredibly created by the sound design actually by the engine running. I wonder if, if you were conscious Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I like things which aren't driven by, I mean, I, I mean, obviously acting is, is good, so I'm not complaining about acting, but, but I, I quite like it, things, I quite like observational kind of uh, filming. So the, the, whether it's like fiction or non-fiction, like uh, it's for me, it's, it's quite interesting to be sort of just watching what's happening, what, watching the uh, people in front of the camera, and then trying to find a way of the story being told through what they're doing rather than what they say to each other. So in those situations, and in particular in, the, in this world, which is following two kind of uh, Afghan refugees, it has to be done a lot through Sandy because it's not a massive amount of dialogue. You know that they they they. they they, were, they, you know, basically we filmed with them for like a couple of months traveling kind of a very long journey. So, so their relationship do develop and they do talk to each other. But in general, the dialogue is quite functional. It's just really, you know, in the, especially in relation to the world around them because they, Pashto speakers, they can't really speak that much to anyone else around them. So they're kind of isolated. So, and I, you know, and I, in general, I, I prefer if, if you can tell a story without having to tell it in the dialogue, then it's good. So yeah, so obviously then music or sound design in general can become a more important way of of getting some sort of narrative. You know, if you're observing people, you know, the, the, those images can be very neutral unless you, unless you give some sort of shape either in the editing or the, on the sound to, to try and give some meaning to those images. But it was just very interesting that the, that the sound design of the uh, humming of the, of the engine seemed much more, actually much more, ten, created more tension than music would. Right, yeah, good, good. It was nice that the you know, music <laughs> stopped and then it yeah. depended on the sound. Yeah. And, and an import, important choice, Michael, not to use, not to subtitle. Well, it, var it, var it varies bits, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there are areas, I mean, in that particular case, uh, oh, you mean on the first one? On well, this I was one? thinking of this, this actually. One, yeah. yeah, I mean, the thing is like... Because at the end, you get the subtitle up, Long Live Serbia or whatever yeah. they say. And, uh, and that makes the point even more that it was a sequence where certain things could have been subtitled but aren't. But that, so therefore, you're in the dark more yeah, I mean, providing I this, you don't speak. Yeah, I think so. in this particular case, you know, we were, you know, I mean, obviously, the main characters in this film are, are people like the Michael Nicholson character. So it's like people who don't understand what's going on. So it kind of felt right to kind of put you in the bus in his perspective. There's also, in this case, uh, I'm not sure how clear it is from that context, in that clip, but there's a confusion because they think at the beginning they're going to come and pull the Bosnian children off, or the Muslim children off. And that includes the girl that he's trying to bring out. So from his point of view, it's particularly like he's got, uh, he's trying to adopt, he's going to try and smuggle out this girl and he's then going to adopt her and she's Muslim, and he thinks because these are Serb, Serb guys, they're going to pull them off, and actually what they're doing is pulling off the Serb children because they don't want the Serb children to get out. So, this, so that confusion was quite important, that, yeah. that you know, there was a sense of that confusion not knowing what was going on for the story point <laughs> yes. of view there as well. Yeah. But I, mean, I think in the, in the, but in the probably it was a bit of the same in, in this world because the, because the two refugees are Pashtun speakers, so they can sort of understand uh, the Farsi that's going on around them, but they can't really talk it properly, so there's a, there's a sort of slight language barrier going on there as well. Yeah. in the non-professional character. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously there are professional children actors, but I try and avoid those. You know, I think, um, I mean, I, th I mean, you know, obviously, I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. I think it does depend on what tone, what register you want your film to have. If you have a very scripted film, like for instance, in the, 
in the cock and bull story. There's like the, in the script of it, in the, you know, there is the, the boy playing Tristan Shandy. And so he is, you know, it's, you know it's, especially because it's a film of a book. So it's very like, you know, we're aware this is a period film, it's a film of a book. So he can afford to be very, um, he can, for, he can you, he, he, it's okay for it to sound like it's very scripted for him. And then we kind of say, you know, then we have Steve complaining about his acting not being very good. You know? so, so in that context, someone who's got experience, children have got experience of coming on and performing is fine. But I think in general, uh, with children, you know, it's, it's, it, I, I personally don't, if you feel the, the performing, I don't like it, so it's better to have, you know, non, non, it's almost by definition they're non-professional. But then I think you have to find children who are, you know, therefore close to the part. So, I mean, if, for instance, in that scene there, I mean, so I just said, like, they're all, act, you know, there's, there's a lot of very professional actors there, but obviously people like Amira, the girl, she's a girl who, this was filmed like three months after the war finished in Bosnia. She'd lived the last four years through the war in Sar the siege of Sarajevo. She was kind of a Muslim girl. She was being pulled out of her context. You know, probably had some of the same, you know, obviously completely in a different, completely kind of safe context, but nevertheless still like out of, you know, her, that city for the first time, out of war for the first time for a long time. So there were parallels between their experience of the kids on the bus and the people in the story. And when we got to the Croatian coast with the sea, it was the first time they'd been to the sea either ever or certainly for the last four or five years. They'd been stuck in a city being bombed for the last three or four years. So they all went kind of crazy running into the sea as a, a natural kind of spontaneous reaction to getting out. And similarly, you know, Jamal and, and Ayatollah, the two guys in, in this world, they, um, you know, they were you know, two people, they, they both Afghan refugees living in Peshawar. And uh, you know, one of the criteria we had originally was that, that they, we, you know, we, were, we weren't trying to like give them, um, they were, we weren't trying to like get them to Britain as part of their life. This was a fiction film. We wanted to try and find two people who we thought would be would, would enjoy the process, and, and, but then be happy to go back to Peshawar. But actually, after we finished the filming, Jamal, the younger one, then made his own way back to Britain and is now living in Britain as a refugee. So, so, that, so it's like you know, there's you know, there's quite quite close overlaps between the kind of experience of the person and the experience of the character. Is there a shift in form as well in the sequence? Uh, oh, well, the, the, you mean in, in, in this one here? Yeah. Well, no, I mean there the, the, were deliberate shifts between video footage and, and, and mm. between like either genuine archive or where we say the Jimmy Nesbitt's character is a cameraman so like there come in bits where it's like he's observing oh, that, that um, but but then there may be accidental shifts in format and the system as well. <laughs> the, the dead body lying on the street is that archive footage or that uh, Hang on I'm not sure which so the, the beginning the very beginning the sequence is archive and then we have and then as I say I think the guy running is actually taken it's like a image particular image from archive but we recreated so we obviously tried by then we did we'd, in that film we did some sequences so that'd be archive we tried, we tried you know, where we had to do uh, that kind of footage to use the real footage, you know, so because it is around journalists and TV journalists, so that they kind of, that, you, know, they're, the, the, they're, you know, their job in the film is to get that kind of footage. It felt there was ways of getting in and out of real footage. And that I, you know, but it said it seemed better to try and use real footage where possible. It seemed like the idea was that the most shocking images or the most powerful images would be the real images to try and keep reminding people this, you know, the reason we're making this film is in order to think about the, what happened there and the, and the real war as opposed to like get involved in the drama of the individuals. And that's one, of, it's a difficult area for, you know, for me, the starting point in that film was Michael Nixon's book and, and I, that was actually, it wasn't my original idea. Someone came to me with the book and said, do you want to make a film? But for me, it was like, that was a kind of peg to think about the war in Bosnia and why we'd all been sitting around doing nothing. So there's a bit of a tension between the individual story and the, and the, kind of, and the other stories around it. You know, and, you know, for me, I, I, I kind of wanted to kind of keep throwing, kind of keep moving away from his story with the girl back into kind of the, the actual, you know, sort of the archive of what was going on to people in, in Bosnia. I think it's very interesting that you contrast that with Brian Gitano's Redacted, mm -hmm. where he recreates everything. Um, and I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, it's a bit more problematic because it feels recreated throughout the film. And then I personally think there's, there's something lacking in that film. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, I think, it's, I think you know, you can do, you can, I think any, any technique is, is kind of, you can, it depends what you're trying to do. For me, like moving from slight different relationship to knowing that's archived to knowing that's recreated, back and moving between those kind of feelings about it. I quite like that, I quite like that in films generally, like between moving the fiction of Tristan Shandy to Steve, which you know is kind of Steve playing Steve, but still it's kind of a different sense of what, how fictional it is. Mm -hmm. I think those, sh those shifts from one kind of tone to another, I like those kind of shifts. Mm -hmm. But e equally, I mean, lots of people hate them. They feel that takes them out of the film, you know, and sort of destroys the sort of unity of the film. You know, I think it depends what you're trying to do. You know, you would say it's very like we were saying, Mark, about um, non-professional, mixing the non-professional and professional, and then you come out of this 
this shot here and it moves to the much clearer, you know, what we yeah. think of as good quality film. And they're very, it's in the texture, the tone, the, you jump into a different... Yeah, I think also it's like, you know, the acting mode is like different, you know, so the you know, I, I, for me, it depends. You look at the, those sequences, you could, I could, you could perhaps just feel like they're both exactly the same, there's no difference. But to me, like, for instance, he is... Uh, He's an actor now. He, he's an actor who, again, he was like in Sarajevo during the war. So it's not, it's not like his experience is that far apart. But he had, he kind of, you know, and, and, and with the British and American actors as well, that they, every time you see them, they, they, in a way, they're like trying to tell you something about their character. They're trying to tell you something about the scene as well, which is not always a bad thing, but it's different to a non professional actor. So for me, the guy on the bus in the first one is just pulling people off a bus. He, and it's just, it's, it's just that. And I quite like that. I can understand why other people find it boring, but I quite like it when people are just doing what they do as opposed to, Making you like you know making a character point, whereas and, you know I think you know this actor I've forgotten his name now, but I think he had a a point to make about he hated he hated these people who did this, so he wants to he, so he's pushing he's ramping it up that bit more and equally you know Stephen who's a great actor is like wanting you to think about what he's feeling so when you see him he's like trying to convey to you what mm. is going on inside his head which again is all cl good classic acting but it's a mm. different sort of thing to how people are in real life I think. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, obviously the environment of the film is kind of important. So, I mean, in the case of the trip, it is a sort of, you know, it, it, was, it was, you know, I, I'm from that part of England, Steve's from that part of England, so it was a bit, you know, as, as is the premise that is going back to show off the kind of his a, 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 a kind of very positive version of his home sort of thing, and that's that's fun to do. I mean, I think in the case of Sarajevo. It's more, I mean, there's obviously the landscape, but also the city. I, I did want it to feel European. I think when we were, you know, for, it was a big shock if you were alive at the time. The big shock is a war in Europe, you know, kind of having spent sort of, uh, you know, having felt like that was over. That was something, that only in history did wars in Europe happen. And suddenly there was this war in Europe and we were all ignoring it and not doing anything about it. So when we went there, I mean, when we went there, it was, I'd say the first time I went there was like four weeks after the war finished. And I think at the time, it, all the music you, know, you heard in bars and cafes, things like Oasis, I think, at the time. But like, so, so to, winding back to the three years earlier, which is when the film starts, the beginning of the war, what we, we kind of tried to use as much kind of British music as possible in it to remind you that this is not some exotic kind of place where, because you know, a lot of coverage of the war at the time was about how, you know, it's like, are there Balkans? It's, you know, they always fight in the Balkans. It's just this place where it's, this is what you, what do you expect? You know, you, you should, we shouldn't get involved because it's just this mad Balkans kind of place. So I wanted to kind of avoid, avoid anything which was like bigging up the kind of ethnic side of, of anything and just be, well, this is a modern European city. They listen to the same music we listen to, you know, they have all the same aspirations we have and, it, and the war's going on and we're ignoring it. Um, you mentioned again that you think that it's something that we are ignoring. And I think it's quite interesting the way you talk about we or us. Um, if you connect this to cinema, maybe more in general, what is what is cinema? What kind of function does it have? For you? Does it have something very specific where you want to remind people, where you want to confront them, where you want to teach them or educate them? Like, how, how do you think more generally, so to speak, what is the function? Well, I think cinema can be whatever you want it to be. So it's not like it prescribes like cinema should do this. It's not like you can say cinema should comment on the world or cinema should be moral or cinema should be political or cinema should be a fantasy. I think cinema can be whatever you want it to be. So for me, it's, I, I choose, you know, for me, the films I make are just about things that I'm interested in. You know, and that, and that it's, so it's, you know, they're obviously kind of quite a wide range of things. It's not like they're all trying to do the same thing. But for, so for, I don't really think it, it, there's a sort of obligation on cinema to be, be anything, but for me, Make a film, it's just, am I interested in it? I'm afraid it's as boring and selfish as that. So this was something that I was interested in, in making, you know, but it wasn't so much. And obviously, you know, you do a film about something like that, you, you know, the interest is that why, why do we do nothing about it? Why do we like to happen? Why, why were we so com complacent when it was going on? You want people to think about that, but not in a way that, especially not in a way that it's like, 
pointing your finger like it was your fault because it's, it's every, you know, every, we all share that responsibility. And I think, you know, the, I mean, as I say, this project was brought to me, but I think the advantage of, you know, the role of journalists in this kind of film is that they are kind of standing for us because they're the people who, who kind of mediate us. It's through them we get our, exp our understanding of what's going on. So they're like, just like us, but a little bit closer to the events than we are. But they're still essentially just standing there watching. Kind of shared responsibility as kind of the eyes and ears of an event, being able to kind of frame it and then show it to, a, to a, an audience. Yeah, but yeah, but you can only be responsible for just doing what you feel is is interesting. Not like responsible that you have, you sort of uh, have any kind of wider role than that. So you, all you can do is say what you feel is is, is something interesting. But you know. Uh, it's, and, you know, and equally, lots of films, of course, seem very irresponsible on the surface. You know, I don't think it's, you can say, well, you must never show a killing in a film because I might encourage a film. You must never show, you, know, you, you, you should be able to look at bad things and good things and fantasy and, and reality. It's, 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 cinema should be whatever you want it to be. Okay, um, um, let's, um, let's, that was interrupted. Let's um, move on to, I've got some to Geneva and look at something from there. I wanted to, Michael, I wanted to talk something about, something I thought was interesting about see, a scene construction. I, I, I picked this scene out because it, um, um, it looks like it's going to be a longer scene <laughs> uh, and that it's ready to have, so, and then it, 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 sto it stops. And I think this is something that happens quite a, a lot in your film. I just, I just wanted to show it. Short it's is good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, the, 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 when he, come, he comes in at the beginning and it's like, here's the beginning of a scene, he's coming home, it's going to be a scene, you get the shot of the table, it might be a dinner tent scene, but it doesn't last very long. Your expectations about length are, are disrupted, I think. I, I particularly like the way this happens in Genova. I, I just interested you to talk about this uh, I mean, I don't know if that was longer and you cut it down in editing. Yeah, or but that's true of everything. I mean, everything's yeah. longer and then you cut it down in editing. I mean, I think, I mean, I think uh, we touched on this a bit last night. That, that, you know, the, in a way, this film is just an observation of a father and two children, a father and two girls. And so I guess, uh, I guess you know, to some extent, you know, so for, I, I like the idea of just doing something very domestic and that it was just going to be about their relationship and try and kind of like capture something of what it's like to be in a family. So nothing kind of bigger than that, then obviously if you're doing that, the issue is then about sort of, well, to what extent is that engaging? To what extent, you know, is that um, uh, something that is watchable? And, you know, I think we talk, again talked about this yesterday that in a sense, like when you show little clips which are very scripted and there's like dialogue which it, it sort of it brings out the theme of, of, the, of the film or the scene or where there's a very dramatic clash, those sort of clips, you know, that we, we, in a sense which are melodramatic where people like, express what, what is important in the story. And those sort of scenes, kind of, as, they, as clips, kind of seem very easy, you know, because, because you've got some content, you've got a performance, you've got an actor doing these lines, it's well written, all that kind of stuff is, is the kind of basic stuff of, 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 of the drama, but, which is stuff that I, in general, I don't particularly like. So actually, in the long run, they just become more and more melodramatic and less, and less interesting. So like those sort of, this, a film like this, which you know, was, was very improvised and was really just trying to get, capture something of the relationship between the, the three people in that scene, it, it, you know, it's, it's very hard, it's, it may be very hard as a film, but it's certainly very hard as a clip because there's never anything that big or dramatic going on at any particular moment because it's trying to observe their relationship and, and hopefully gradually you become involved with them and then gradually you kind of care, care about them. So in terms of rhythm, I think, I think probably on that film in particular, all the way through, there's a kind of issue of like, okay, well, to what extent are people going to expect something to happen? You know, to what, to what, rit what rhythm we, we can find which will, will make it a kind of watchable exploration of those relationships. And the idea, central idea is that, is that the young girl is feeling guilty about her, the death of her mum. So there's always a kind of feeling around the girl, mm. like, you know, is she going to be right? And they're, you know, sometimes they're being a little over careful with her. Sometimes, you know, they, they sort of, they, her sister's hostile and so on. So it's, it's really the minutiae of mm. their relationship and how they, how they deal with this guilt and how they deal with the absence of the mum. So, you know, every scene is just a, a kind of moment to, to observe. And once you feel like you've observed that moment, then, then it, can, it may be in that particular case, it's quite nice to have a feeling like, uh, oh, this is going to you know, be some big dialogue, and then it, it's not, just to try and keep the rhythm varied enough that people can keep watching. But there's nothing more coherent than that about it, I think. Can I, can I just ask about, I mean, the decision to have the figure of the mother, the, the, the haunting, which I kept thinking, I and mean, I like the film very, very much, I, I, I kept thinking, don't look now. And I wonder why you'd, why you'd chosen to, to, to do 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the story. I don't know. I mean, that was just, we were working on that script with Lawrence Curry. I think, you know, to be honest, it was probably my idea of the original story. I, I guess, I mean, I, I you know, I, I think one of the ideas of the film was like, is how is you know, how would you deal with the uh, mum being absent? How would you deal? How would you deal with the daughter feeling guilty? So that those kind of ideas were just part of the original idea. I don't know why, but that was part of the idea. But I, I agree that there was always. A, I mean, it was impossible to make a film in Italy. It's almost impossible to make a film in Italy at all without thinking about it, doesn't it? But it's certainly impossible with this sort of story. And I, I guess, you know, we're kind of aware that, you know, in, in a way it's the reverse of the double now story, where it's, you know, the, the girl that's dead and here the mum's dead. I mean, that, I mean, I think maybe, you know, we were too aware of that, so we wanted to try and avoid... I, I, there, was, there was always... I mean, that's back to the kind of issue about rhythm. So there's always the possibility that something bad would happen. There's always the possibility it would become a kind of, kind of horror story. And, and there's always the possibility mm -hmm. of there being some, you know, kind of punitive conclusion as there is in you know, a lot of those that genre of films mm -hmm. to make it dramatic and round it and end it and we you know to be honest when we were working on the script we spent quite a lot of time kind of discussing that and whether you know she she should in the end pay for you know that, that she can't you know, that they fail to get her out of her sense of guilt and they fail to combat that sense of absence and I just felt like actually I wanted to make a film about families that can survive you know that we, we have some sort of absence you can get over that and that, that even if that's not as dramatic that that is all, I didn't want the film to end with her kind of getting punished for it. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> you know so it's quite a tricky narrative strategy to have an idea that uh, people might think something's going to happen but nothing is going to happen but that's quite, it's quite a thin strand of a plot to work with. I think lots happen. <laughs> yeah, well, good, good, good. <laughs> I think it's packed. Here's a, you're talking about minutiae. I think there's some great minutiae in this, so have a, have a look at this. The, the, him, <laughs> him sitting on the bed with her. Again, it's the quickness, it's easily missed, but also her gesture with the arm uh, up the wall. That's, that's wonderful. And, uh, Anything that, to say about, about that without ruining it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean that. I mean that it is like you know, said before about uh, observational stuff. So it's, it's about you know for that. I mean, Colin was yes. Colin was great with the children. So they had to get to know each other fairly quickly. We had about a week in Geneva before we started filming. Um, so he was very good at kind of like establishing a kind of sense of family, mm -hmm. and um, and the two girls, you know, kind of got on well well enough. So. It was really, you know, it was really, it's then when you start filming, it's just, it, so we had like a week of them like, you know, going off and like going to the city and shopping and all that sort of stuff to get to know each other. And then when we started filming, it's just like trying to allow them space to do that, what they wanted to do. So, I, I mean, I can't remember in that particular case whether I suggested it or that she did it or not, but she was, she was, uh, she was really great kind of to work with. She was a really lovely kind of channel to work with. And, um, and I like the old guy in that actually as well. He was someone we bumped into in an estate agent, and he was genuinely deaf, so he would just go around and saying stuff. And everyone would be like, what, what, what? He would just kind of wander around the flat. So, you know, it's about coming across things, and then if you come across something you like, you're finding it, and then trying to find a way of fitting it into the kind of overall kind of shape and pattern of the film. There are two other things, um, there are probably more, but the two other things that strike me as maybe important to talk about in, in this sequence for instance, one is lighting. Um, I, I, I probably said because of the way there's this sense of it being gloomy in place. You know that in, in very bright places where it's gloomy and so bright sunlight place and it's gloomy inside. Um, also, I thought we should say something about the music, but, but um, um, the, the lighting is a... Um, yeah, about. I mean, I th well, most of the stuff we do is with a lot of available light. So, um, I mean, obviously, in a situation like this, as, as they're finding, you've got to kind of put some extra light in to, 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 to see things. But I think, I mean, generally, it's quite... I mean, obviously, when you're choosing locations, you, you I mean, for me, locations are about the whole world of the film. It's not just about the look of them. But obviously, as you choose them, you, you're, you're, in a way, you're doing a lot of the... You create, that is, you're, you're, as you pick the location, that's determining a lot of how the film looks. And, and Marcel Ziskin shot this, who I've worked with on a lot of films. And so we try and find, you know, places where we think the, the light that's there is good. So obviously in Geneva you have that sense of, you know, you have very narrow uh, alleyways, these sort yeah. of 15th, 16th century kind of palazzos, apartments. They are very dark and gloomy naturally. It is outside. 
very bright naturally. So it's a question. It's not really a question of like, okay, let's start with the kind of you know, idea of like we want bright, but you know, we want that chiaroscuro effect. It's more like okay, th this is the world. This is the world. You know, that film started from visiting Geneva by chance and feeling like I'd like to make a film there. So it starts from Geneva, mm. and then it's about what, and then it's about what are the things that are interesting about it, what are the things you like about it. That whole kind of labyrinth of the narrow alleyways, all that is, is given by the city. It's not like you're you're not inventing that. And it's the same with the light. I think you know, I would like, I prefer the, the idea that we use natural light rather than kind of lighting it, you know, and, uh, rather than kind of creating something kind of which is artificial. That's not to say that Marcel's not doing stuff or that, that you're not making choices. Obviously you do, you choose what time of day, what, you know, where the light, which, you know, different times of day you've got light coming from different angles, you've got more light or less light, you place the actors in relation to the light or not, you know, if you're, if you're organising a scene. So you, you obviously work, just like a documentary photo stills photographer, but you're still composing the image, even though he's taking what's, you know, what's there. And, and, and you, you, so you're working with the available light, but I prefer that to rather than, than starting with a kind of, okay, this is the look of the film, and let's impose that look on the place. You know, I, 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 and the biggest thing for me in preparing films is spending, you know, is you know, spending time in the place, and, and, and that affects both the story and the characters and the look of the film, and, you know, and, the, and the, the physical kind of space of the film. You mentioned Marcel Ziskin, because he also did Code 46 with yeah. you, and I noticed he'd done episodes of The Killing. As yes, well. recently, yeah, yeah. Which is not a dis, in some ways, not dissimilar in some elements of um, shooting style. Yeah, I guess. He did the second series of The Killing, I think. Third. Third, was it? Third, okay, yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But he's it's obviously a considerable. Uh, um, any other I mean, point on lighting before we. Uh, yeah, it's interesting in Geneva, because I think the film opens in, is in Chicago. It's in yeah. Why? Why was that interesting for you? I mean, you made a point for general, I think that's really interesting, but why did you contrast it with that rather than with another European city? Well, I, I, I quite like the idea of like displacement of people being out of, you know, coming from one place to another. So, I mean, with general, I guess, that, I mean, so it's partly that obviously the, the, it's a bigger trans, translation for the girls, that the girls are kind of from Chicago and come, or from America and come to Europe. So I, I like the idea that they were pulled as far as possible out of their world. That you know that he thinks it's kind of new start but in a way. The, the, the film all takes place like just in the summer holidays, like the August when they arrive there. So they arrive in August in Geneva when August is when Geneva's dead in itself because it's August, but also they, their school hasn't started, so they've nothing to do. So they're like stuck in. I want you know the idea was always that they're too kind of like that they they've had the death of their mum and then they suddenly put, brought to this place where they know no one and don't know the place, don't know the language, and so that they're sort of left. They're you know forced back in on the family. So it's just about this family in this kind of bubble. Uh, so I guess that was the main part of it. I quite like the idea that Colin's character was already out of his world. You know, that it, felt, it felt to me at a boring story level. I believed it more that if you were British and American and your wife died, you'd want to get away and come back than if you were at home. That, you know, if he'd been at home in London with his kids, would he have wanted to go to Geneva? That, would, that felt to me just as a story point less kind of part, sense, made, made less sense. It seemed, it seemed to me that because he you know, would have be in Chicago with his wife and his wife's dead, he would want to get away from that and he's not from there. So he, would, he, he would, felt like it made more sense. And plus, I, I thought Colin would be great for the part as well. But, but I think that it was really the story that was... So there are often kind of weird little things like that, that that aren't really in the film and don't make, necessarily make any sense. But from, from my point of view, making it kind of quite important. But in, in general, anyway, I like the idea of people being out of culture and people, you know, having to deal with people from other cultures. I think that is something that happens more and more, you know, and that kind of sense of being in exile or being, you know, uh, uh, like having to ch change your kind of, kind of the, you know, being in an environment that's not your environment is something that is more more common experience. Mateo. Yeah, I'm interested in some of the things you were saying about tempo and rhythm, because I wonder how that, I mean, I think a running theme of what you've said over the last two days has been about chaos and, and contingent and, you know, things kind of happening that, that are unanticipated, and I think uh, what, what a, lot, a lot of people perhaps associate that with is something like a, a long, the long take where you know the kind of the, the world bubbles up and, and, and the world is allowed to just exist and you, you get these chance events that are occurring. But it seems that the rhythm of your filmmaking and these kinds of scenes that, um, that, that are just very fleeting um, seems to betray perhaps that you're in... I mean, it, it reminds me perhaps, this is um, taking it further, but someone like Malik, for example, he uses this kind of rhythm, but then he's also in search of something that's, that's chance or chaos. He's picking out these moments from, from the world. And I wondered if it, and I mean, there are moments in Geneva where, for example, the, the camera just seems to sort of wander up to the, to the top of the streets. Of them. And I'm wondering how, it seems to me, and is it just that you're allowing um, the, the, the kind of setup of the whole method of filmmaking to be something that affords space for, for chance events? Or is it actually that you're, you're in pursuit of them and your filmmaking is actually geared towards finding them and then putting them all together? I mean, is it something you're seeking out as opposed to allowing them? 
Uh, well, there, there are variations on the same thing, though, aren't they, in a way? But, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like, in principle, do I like the idea of chance events? Yes. I mean, you can't, you, it's, you can't really organise chance events or they cease to be chance events. So, in a way, all you can do is, like, have a kind of a way of working where, it, you, which, which has the possibility of allowing them in, you know? So, I mean, I think in general, it's like, we're, it's, it's, general is quite a kind of an odd example because I think when we started, because it was very intimate with and just being about these three people in this world, and because I wanted to take them out into Geneva, I kind of I think probably I thought it was going to be more there would be more of that out, you know that I, I can, when we originally had the idea I thought I think we thought it'd be more of like the interaction between them and Geneva. And then in a sense, because of the nature of the story, you know, but we just hadn't kind of thought it through well enough. They are very much kind of in a bubble. So, so any chance events are, tend to be very background. You know, Geneva is very background. Although is that although you know the, the look of the city, see the presence of the city is quite big in the film. They don't really interact with it that much. They wander through the streets. They don't really do it. You know, it's like they wander through the streets, they piano lesson, or they get lost in the streets and so on. But it's not because they are tourists, because they're waiting for their life to get going in Geneva. They're kind of like in a little kind of bub bubble before it starts. So we actually kind of use a small camera on that film. I mean, in general, we, because we do some films which are like in the streets and, and it's like in public places and uh, so on, we, you know, we often use small cameras and you know, no boom mics and no lights and no shouting and that. So we, we used to work in like with a very small crew in order to try and capture stuff that is, you know, is not part of our film. And, we, and, and so that's kind of way we work now anyway. But in Geneva, we, used, we did all that. And that actually, kind of at the end of it, all, I felt we didn't really get as much value from that as possible. It might have been better, actually, just the actual physical camera was not a camera I hated you know, on that film. And uh, I, I kind of regretted afterwards that we'd gone for that more, that, that kind of more kind of like, you know, sort of in, in, the, in the street camera. We went for like a kind of a, a sort of that little kind of, uh, HDV camera, which was really annoying camera, which we thought would give us more flexibility when we were out the streets, but actually we could have used a much kind of more like kind of 35mm setup and had better results, I think. So it was, it was quite a, f it was quite an odd film from that point of view. You know, it, and, and in a way it was just, it was, it was around that area because it kind of felt like, you know, originally there would be more contingent stuff coming in and actually it kind of basically was just observing the family really the whole time. Mm. I'm not sure that's better explanation. Well, one thing I've noticed, Mark, that's uh, in your scene, you also see in other things that adopt maybe a similar style of the, of, of the documentary style is moving from very close shots. So like the girl eating spaghetti is what I think in the bit we've, we looked at, it was very, very close to her. Um, like I don't know where the camera is and you like, almost have to move the breadsticks out of the way and get it right, so it's very near. But then there's this characteristic shot that's quite far back that, 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 that suddenly shows them at quite a distance and you, 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 their voices are more... more uh, um, uh, da, 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 this, uh, this just give a very quick example of that where we, we move... Um. So we're very close to her. And then you get a shot like this, where you're away. And it's not just of all of them, it feels like it's gone back further than maybe that it's watching from some eye further away. Yeah. Well, and also, like you said about the mirrors, quite a lot of mirrors knocking around this one as well, I think, to sort of like, slightly sort of, I mean, I don't know why, rhythm is very, it's a very personal thing, isn't it? It's like very hard to say why you feel like that's what, the sort of, uh, when you're editing a scene, you know, you, I mean, as you, edit, you know, you edit film, we're probably editing, I don't know, for like four or five months. So uh, you know, you you try, you, you're constantly trying to find a rhythm that you like. But it's a very personal. It's very hard to say what the kind of objective reasons why you like a certain rhythm but between the kind of tight stuff and the wide stuff and so on. So I don't really have a very coherent angle. I think that might be a mirror shot. We, I seem to remember that scene. We used quite a lot of mirrors as well to get further back. You know, to, to right. sort of to, to sort of see, to, you know, to I mean. I don't know. I mean, you could, I, I could probably you could probably justify it with lots of you know lots of you know kind of arguments. But in truth, it's just you just, when you're editing, you're just trying you're just trying to find something that you feel kind of gives the right kind of shape and dynamic to the scene. And it's not very easy to. But presumably, while is. you're filming, you're thinking, I want some shots back here. I want to be well, ready. Obviously, you for choose some the shots. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, it would be yeah again because yeah. I mean, yeah. Obviously, you choose the shots. And obviously, there are times when you know you have to take that particular bit of a shot. So it. Yeah, but that, that's the difference between the, you know, how organised your filming is. So obviously if you're handheld wandering around, it's rare that you know, OK, this is the moving, we're definitely going to be on this line on this because if it's improvised or it's handheld, that's not really a genuine option. But obviously there are times when you want to have a particular moment where, you know, if you're going to track in on a particular line of dialogue, you know, you're making that decision early on. 
And that's what I'm saying. If you're doing an observational film, most of those decisions are made later. So of course you have to have, you have to get the material, but exactly when you're going to go back and forward between the wide and the tight, obviously you're going to decide that later in the cutting room. It sets so a potential between intimacy as well, and then some more um, overview or sense. It moves us around between being there and involved, and something then more where we take a more an observation or yeah, different, between observing uh, them and they being seem with attitudinally them, yeah. wanting to do yeah, that. Yeah, which, which is a more subtle version of like going between Steve talking to camera and then being back in the scene, or Steve as Steve yeah. and Steve as character, or yes. you know, archive footage and non-archive, or whatever. It, yeah. the, all those shifts of tone are quite nice. But I mean, I think every film, I mean, every, in a way you have a limited, quite a limited number of options on a film about what you're playing with. So every film's playing with those. It just I guess it depends how, how invisible or visible you want those changes to be sometimes. They might be in that film as well. Some, you know, obviously, there's one thing is like being with them, then, then back from, from, from the sense of like sort of like remember, remembering in a way that they are this little family in Geneva in this foreign place. And then there may be moments in that film as well where it's a little bit about the mum as well, like you're with the girl, and then you're you know, away from her, and it's like yeah. you know, there's the sense of the mum that's missing as well. Mm. Katerina. How did it affect it? Um, well, it is, but it is personal, isn't it? So you can you can discuss it. You can discuss it afterwards. All you're doing really is then dis you're then judging from what's there and like making reason, giving reasons for what's there. As I mean, so it, it's it's a kind of after the event. I mean, so I could sort of like try and justify the rhythm of the film or, or so on, but it would be as much you know as relevant as someone else describing it, because when you're making it, you're not kind of, it's not as analytical as that. You're not starting with the analysis, I want 85% of the film to be on Colin and 25, you know, whatever, doesn't even add up, 15% on the girl. I mean, I, I mean, in terms of the balance of the film, I guess, the, I think probably in general for me, uh, and maybe it's a, a, prob a weakness rather, rather than anything else, it's that I quite like the idea that you, know, you try and give us all the characters in the film as much kind of, you try to be with them as much as possible. Certainly, sort of like this. I mean, so the, you know, rather than it being, yeah, you know, and so rather than feeling like, okay, there's a film which is really clear that this person is like the central character, or this person is the hero, this person is bad, that their point of view is correct, that point of view is incorrect, that, that, that when you're with that character, you want to be as close to that character as possible. So in this case, you know, maybe it should have perhaps been more clearly the girl's film, because in a way, it is the girl's story. The starting point is the girl who's feeling guilty. But I, I guess. I wanted it to be about the dad as well. I wanted it to be about the idea that you know, I think dads in films are often get very bad press. You know, I wanted it to be the idea that you don't have to be an idiot to be a dad. You can also actually be quite, you know, and it's not like you he's can be the Colin Firth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it's not like he does. It wasn't like we wanted to make him. It, you know, I wanted it to be more common. Uh, George, but it's good about. But it's like, I like the idea that yeah, he's not. He doesn't. He doesn't have to do things which are stupid in order to serve the plot. I think dads in, dads in films often have to do really stupid, blind things because it wants to be about how the you know the child has to overcome the idiot dad or whatever. And I wanted it to be a, a more kind of you know sympathetic portrait of the family. You know that actually even the older girl, who I think is the minor character. So in terms of rhythm distribution, you know, inevitably she gets. She gets less. I think you know she gets less because her story is not as central to the relationship. But but you know what? I want to feel that it's actually about people. That most people are, in most situations are trying to do the best. They may not do the right thing, but they're trying to do the best, and, and that, that 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 can survive. You know. So that is it is unfortunately a very gentle, you know, small film because of that. But it's a, it was a plea for fathers. The, the girls are not, you're saying they're not professional actors? No, hang on, so this, that, no, so that's an interesting point. So I mean, that, so the, these girls are professional actors. And, and, you know, and I think, um, I mean, it's a tricky area. That may have been, to be honest, that may have been in the back of my head one of the reasons we went for um, American, American girls. I mean, there was a whole bunch of reasons, uh, uh, as we talked about before, but it's certainly the case that if you, if you, if you are going to use professional actors, and I, 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 think I just felt with, these, with this story, Especially the younger girls' story, which obviously is the harder, harder one to cast, because the older girls like 14, 15. So in a sense, you have quite a lot of children who act that age. But for the, old, the younger girl, because it was about loss of the mum and so on, and she had to do quite a lot of stuff that was 
quite emotional, quite exposing kind of emotions. Uh, we kind of thought from the beginning we would kind of get someone who, who uh, or at least we'd try and find someone who had experience. And in truth, you know, in America you have a massively bigger pool of people who have acted at that age. I mean, it is scary in America that you go to, I did a meeting some actors uh, just recently, and some of them were like teenage girls, and so many of them, like, they say, oh yeah, I came to LA at the age of six, my parents kind of came from Missouri or whatever at the age of six with them and just started doing TV kind of pilots. So, but, so what it means is, although it's horrific, you do have a kind of group of people who've done quite a lot of acting. And uh, the older girl was actually Brian De Palma's stepdaughter. And, uh, was what? I'm Brian De Palma's stepdaughter. Brian De Palma's yeah, stepdaughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, someone mentioned redacted before. A very quick example of, 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 of the uh, distance thing. So they go from this conversation, we're near in, and, and then he gets tired <laughs> when she brings up the question of the... So this is an example, Michael, where it really, it really feels like the camera is being held back from following them, and we're being held at a certain point. Yeah. Away. Yeah. You don't have to say anything, but. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, look, you can. I, mean, I, I think, think I think it's a, re a really nice, a really nice choice there because um, because b because he's moved away. He doesn't want to. There's something he's not wanting to necessarily come No, he's like a Catherine's character, someone who keeps trying to get, yeah. in, get closer into the story. He wants to be more central. Catherine's character is someone who wants to be more important in the film and he's at the margin, you know, yeah. and the, you know, maybe it's sort of unconsciously it's down to that. Yeah. 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 But I mean, you know, there's, as I say, this is kind of, I'm, I think in that case, to be honest, that was a choice we probably made when we were shooting it. It kind of felt right when we were shooting it. So I'm not sure spatial informal concerns are part of that as well, like in terms of having a narrow hallway. With yeah, the well, you've got, yeah. The, you've got the general practical things, obviously. You yeah. can only shoot what you've got. You can't, you can't you know, there's the, and that is restrictive in real locations. That, I, I like that. I like the fact that there are lots of restrictions in real locations. In that instance as well, obviously, you've got a lot of framing. That what I liked about the, the, the apartments in there is that generally two of those kind of apartments, you have this kind of, you have the, the length, so you have this kind of framing, you have that kind of sense of your distance, you can have quite a lot of distance between people. I mean, one of the things about, you know, like the look of films is like where you, obviously, like different cultures have different looks here. So if you shoot in a British house, it's always a nightmare because just the way in which British houses are arranged is terrible. You know, you're constantly just up against some, you know, the wall. Whereas like it, just at general apartments there, they all have that kind of, you know, kind of European thing. And you're able to kind of get much more movement between the characters and change the space between them and see, you know, frame them, you know, down the, all that stuff. So it's a real joy sort of shooting there. That's one of the reasons I try and shoot abroad now in England. <laughs> Even the buses in the previous series too, you can tell kind of, well, buses are a nightmare for one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. buses are a complete nightmare for one. Um, but um, so I mean that you know, So I mean, on the, the practical level, of the bus not so much on in this world, but because it was quite quick. But on Sarajevo, that was a nightmare. You know, that that shoot was like I think we were a day on that bus, and the kids were it was very very hot, and the, everyone was getting very stressed, uh, as you could see from the baby. Uh, the, that the baby was expressing what we were all feeling on that bus. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. I was interested in terms of what you were saying about using dislocation and the kind of and how that relates to how you direct people. If you're if you're kind of picking people up like the American girls and putting them in a new place, do you direct in the to kind of orient them, or do you kind of back off initially to how to show that kind of tension of of people trying to orient themselves in this in this place that you displace them into? I mean. Do, yeah. Yes, but I mean, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's like obviously if you want them to be uncomfortable. They need. It's easier if they are uncomfortable. So you know, if you want them to be lost in the streets, it's easier if they are lost and so on. And in case of like, so you know, with non-professional actors, so like the two guys on the bus, you know, the refugee, Afghan refugees, they wouldn't know that they were going to get pulled off the bus the first time. Obviously, we did it maybe three times, so they, they knew roughly. But the first time around, it's good if they don't know what's happening and then they're surprised. So whenever you can do that, it's good. But at the same time, I, I don't like to like kind of feel like the act I don't think it's in the long run a good thing the actors feel you're tricking them so I would never kind of like deliberately organize something that they felt uh, you know that they were being kind of manipulated because as soon as they start feeling that I think they you know then they become defensive and, you know, and it, it, it's like some of the girls I mean we try to shoot as much as possible in sequence so in, in, in the case of Geneva that's easy because it was quite you know it was very low-key films we were able to start at the beginning of the film you know at the beginning and we it, it was supposed to take place over one month in Geneva so we our shoot was about six weeks. So in a way, the rhythm of the film, the length of the film, duration of the film, was, was kind of pretty much the story that they were experiencing, you know, and they would go down and do their piano stuff. And so the rhythm of the, of the film was quite similar to the rhythm in the story. 
But on the other hand, you know, it's like, like with the girl, the girl had to have nightmares and, and kind of wake up crying. And she was like, she originally said, and so for something like that, what we'd always try and do is, like, she was supposed to be like asleep and waking up. So we always try and shoot that when she was always tired. So we'd shoot at midnight or whatever, or two o'clock. So she would genuinely be sleepy. And so that part was easy. But she was a really sweet girl, but she's like, I can't cry and everything like that. And she'd done a couple of films before and she's like, I can't do it. So, you know, so we, we just said, said, well, look, you know, just do it once and we'll just, you know, we'll just like, you know, run, you know, rather than like doing it lots of ways and you have to keep doing it. If we do it once, you do it right the first time. You get it, do it once, you won't have to do it again. So we'd shoot that in a very long take and just do it once and then she could stop. So, and then once she knew she only had to do it once, then she could cry, you know. I think, you know, part of it was just feeling like she was going to have to kind of be doing it all night, you know, and she didn't want to have to keep doing it. So you have to just, just you know, you have to just on this, you know, in relation to anyone, you know, whether it's a, the actors or the crew, whatever, you have to just decide what, you know, with that particular person, what's helpful to them rather than what the sort of your general technique is. I was wondering, we've talked a lot about how you um, create things around performance uh, and scenes where they can dive up, but what I like most about your films is the sense of place that a lot of them gave, like uh, Karachi or India, some places in India. And maybe because we've talked a lot about the construction of space this year in, in our master's course. And this is a great question about um, intent. Um, the, the construction of space in A Mighty Heart was very clear to me about somebody who's from the outside experiencing this city in a very chaotic way. And that worked really well. But with Trishna, the the street scenes and the way that they were filmed, there seemed to be a coherent idea behind them, but I, I couldn't get... It. Can you say a little bit about how that was created? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, this, I mean... I mean, yeah, the, the, um, okay, well, on, on Mighty, let me take Mighty Heart, sorry. So Mighty Heart, I mean, part of that whole experience from Marianne, the, I, I, I was, uh, again, that's not one that was like my original idea, I was asked by, uh, uh, to, to do the film. And so the, the first kind of meeting I had was with Marianne, who wrote the book, Marianne Pearl, whose husband was kidnapped and beheaded. And uh, so her book was about her experience, really. the film was not really about her husband, it's about her experience from the point at which she's been kidnapped. And that experience was in one particular house. She was in one house in Karachi really, the whole time. And it was about the confusion of what, not knowing what was going on outside, not knowing what had happened to her husband, not being able to understand who was on her side, who wasn't, who was doing, you know, what, what, what was true about what was being said and so on. So, so in a way that, you know, that you, you think when you're doing film, obviously like that, you start, that's the starting point. So it was, you know, I worked in Pakistan before, so that, that we, did, we did all the Pakistan stuff first. And basically, we just tried to recreate as closely as possible the, the events that had happened. We, the, um, uh, we, you know, we met Mayan, but then we met all the other people who had been there at the time, the Pakistan police officers, the American guys who had been agents in the room, the journalists and so on. So we had a massive amount of information. And it was a question of like picking out, uh, the, the, you know, it was a question really from that, it was picking out the, the elements you know, that connected to, 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 to the, the shape of the story. And then trying to be, do, be as directly as possible, as simply as possible. So, so you yeah, know, we were, I mean, if that, I don't know whether that, that you know, that, that, I guess that the world of Pakistan for her was, was a very confused world, and it was quite an obscure world, it was like, and, it was, and it was a dangerous world, a chaotic world. And we, but you know, from our point of view, it was really a question, like, the material was already given, it's just a question how, you know, we should try and capture that as easily as possible. And then inside the house, obviously that was quite a calm world, but it was very, very cut off, you know, and, so, and really she spent the whole time that he was kidnapped, stuck in this one room kind of, you know, wait, waiting to find out whether he was alive or dead, you know. So the, the whole kind of shape of the film, the rhythm of the film, was dictated by the story. I mean, Trishna, is, I mean, it's slightly different. What, what, in what, which, you mean to, which bits of Trishna are you talking about? All the, all the massive street scenes in the city, where the... Well, Trishna, because most of Trishna takes place in Rajasthan. So obviously that, you know, in Raj, the stuff in Rajasthan is where Trishna his home is, and I'm, I'm not, I mean, it's like, it seemed to me that, you know, I don't know how it comes across in the film, but so th that was kind of her world, the world of Rajasthan. I mean, the, in our, I mean, the focus, the one thing about focus before, the focus in that film is kind of both her focus and at the beginning, a little bit more, more the, the, the character that Riz plays, the British guy, so we start really with the British guy, and we start with, Kelly in a way, seeing his point of view of India and Rajasthan, and he's on holiday there. And then when he meets, when he meets, uh, Trishna, really the, even, even the kind of scene in the hotel was sort of half and half between them. And then it becomes Trishna's story. So you sort of shift who you're with kind of at the halfway point. And, uh, you know, I guess when we went to Mumbai, yeah, it, was chaos, it was chaos because Mumbai is chaotic. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, if you're filming, you know, 
what it is like. You, you, you're just recording what's there. But I guess also that she's, you know, in Mumbai again. She it was a little bit like my aunt. She's in her little room, where it's calm. And then outside, it's chaos. She's, you know, she's not part of that world. So maybe a sense of that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Did you, um, when you played Trishna, did you have that picture in mind of what, uh, what kind of sense of place? You know, well, it. it uh, no, I mean the, the Stone Point Trishna was being that place. I was in that, you know, we, we, the idea of Trishna came like ten years before we made it, and I was in Osiyam, which is in Rajasthan, uh, for looking at locations for for Co Forty Six. And so when I was there, I thought it would be good to transpose Tess to that place. So that place was the starting point really, and then it was then we kind of did a kind of the basic sto you know, story translation from nineteenth century England to there. But I mean, we, when we chose for the character of Jay to be like the son of a guy who owns hotels, so then in a way you, you, you know, those, that, that, that decision, which is a story decision, is obviously also a huge location decision, because then you're like in these very luxurious kind of palaces that are now kind of hotels. And so obviously that, you know, as you're deciding on the idea, you're make th th those sort of things have a huge kind of, you know, the idea obviously has a huge impact on the kind of the rhythm of the film, the look of the film, the social context of the film, you know, and the, and we then went and picked the hotels, you know, that, that we thought were right for him, his kind of character, to be in. Um, and obviously, the, the idea of, you know, the idea is that there's a kind of sort of, because you know, in, 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 in Tess, there's the whole idea that, you know, there's been the Northern working class family has bought the manor house and adopted the kind of, you know, the, all the trappings of, of the aristocracy. And, and kind of, so the idea was that Jay's kind of dad had bought the kind of trappings of this kind of, sort of Raj, you know, and, and was living that sort of. Uh, fake world, and, and I think the idea originally uh, with the hotels was that, in a way, it's like it's something really, there's something that's quite, it feels kind of quite wrong about that that Westerners are going and living the life of of, of imperialists you know, in that holiday, but then all the people who worked in the hotel were real workers in the hotel, so the people playing the characters who who, she, who Trishna gets to meet were all real people, and they of course saw the hotel as a great kind of place to work and a source of income, a source of independence. A lot of women, you know, the women that we came across who worked in the tourism industry, that was the, that's a big industry in Rajasthan, and it's their biggest possibility for 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 a, a kind of independent kind of economic activity. So you saw the kind of good side of the hotel system as well as the kind of bad side. That's not really talking about the space of the film at all, but I'm not sure Kate. what else to say. It seems like there's a nice affinity there between your style and some of the thematic concerns in your films, given what you've been saying about how your style is very responsive to the environment you find yourself in. And the films themselves seem to me that they're very often about characters and people who are themselves products of their environments. You've mentioned a lot about how they're about people who are culturally or geographically displaced from one location into another. But um, it also seems like, yeah, how about how the characters are, their choices, their possibilities are circumscribed by the particular environments they inhabit, be it sort of culturally, or, or even geographically with something like Wonderland and the space of London. And Good. Good. I mean, I think. I mean, I think. Obviously, people's behaviour and who you are and how you behave and how you relate to the world is, is like you know, is a, it's a social kind of thing. It's not all about. You know, I think that's why the idea of like stories that abstract individuals and make it kind of dramatic about the individual and and, and their kind of and their narrative. I, I, I don't find that satisfying. And, and you know, I think you know, if ideally in the film you you see enough of the world of person to understand the kind of how you know how they interact with the world around them and how they, they are a product. Of that world, and, and obviously, like just go back to the space. That obviously, you make whenever you make choose, if you're going to film like that, then obviously, you, as you make a choice on a basic idea, you're immediately, you know, uh, you're immediately accepting a lot of the aspects of the story. So we did a film over five years for TV called Every Day. It was about it was about a guy in prison and and his five children growing up visiting once a day, once a year, one, uh, twice a year, and the, and obviously when you do that, you know, you you. you Immediately, obviously, the prison is a confined space. You know that, and, and the house. You know, if you're, these are kids who are like struggling, their mums kind of struggling to keep their family together as the dads in prison. So their house is a confined space. You know, and the, these are not. These are, of course, as you make this, and you're aware that you're going to be working confined spaces. But it'd be, you're not kind of thinking in a kind of like abstract way. I want to. I want to have a kind of like this is my. This is what I want the film to do. I want it to okay, operate in these really confined spaces. But you know. Essentially, so you're, you're aware of that, but it's part. Of the, it's more part of the. It's just part of the, the world. It's part of the story. It's not a kind of aesthetic decision. You know, so like we film in the schools. So obviously, there are inevitably is parallels between the institution of a school and the way that works, the institution of the prison. And yeah. you know, then we we show the kind of countryside. You've got the contrast between this, the confined space of the prison or the house and, and the kind of like the kind of the, 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 these little characters in this vast kind of empty space. But all those things are just inevitable. These all the things are just part of the story. It's not something you're imposing on the story.
Michael, we've only got a few minutes left. You've done amazingly well. I, I don't want us to finish just without saying something about music. You don't finish on a down note like we finished like yesterday. What was the down note? <laughs> I what? can't remember. I remember it was about what something I hated. <laughs> yeah, it was about what, why I hated working on the shock doctrine. I thought it was a relating <laughs> moment. <laughs> um, um, uh, d just, uh, I just play this moment from Wonderland because it's got the Michael Nyman, it's just a few moments from it. Um, and maybe we can just uh, finish, because music's quite an important part of your films. Um, the piano score in, in Geneva and, and, and some of the ways you use uh, pre-existing music in, um, in Welcome to Sarajevo, say, and obviously 24 Hour Party People, uh, where it's on. But here's where, the, uh, for those of you who haven't seen Wonderland, here's, here, 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 this is very near the start of the film, uh, where this is a, a blind date or a, a, an online date or whatever it is, um, and she's walking out on him back into the city, uh, reflecting some of the things Kate was just saying. I'm glad Michael Nyman didn't hear that version. <laughs> it just went to the same quality. Sorry. Do, do you want to say anything about it? Uh, yeah, well, actually, one thing before we talk about m m m just yeah, yeah I mean, obviously, obviously, music's hugely important in films. One point we just watching that is like extras. Like, extras are also hugely important in films, and they're a complete pain in the ass. And it's like, and it's like, it is nine times out of ten, or ninety-nine times out of hundred. You know, if, you, if you're working on a film and you're doing a bar scene, it means you're doing it at 10 o'clock in the morning in some closed bar, and you, it's like, say that, that bar is a picture and piano in Soho. So, but you get a bunch of extras in who have never been so in their life, and then they're like wearing all the wrong clothes, and they're completely sober, they're all the wrong age, and they stand around, and just to get the background looking anything like you want, imagined the picture and piano, so at midnight on a Friday night would be, is, is either it, take, it takes ages and is exhausting, it's very much time to do it, or it just doesn't happen at all. It's incredibly hard to get people who, let's face it, are not like trained, you know, trained in any way and are not getting paid very much money and are not the right sort of people to somehow impersonate in any real way how people behave. So with, with Wonderland, we uh, had a, a, a guy who was his first film we read just done news shooting, uh, news stuff before, and a few bits of documentary called Sean Bobbitt, who's since gone on to do films like The Place Beyond the Pines and, and Shame. Uh, but it was, but he, because he was used to being a news photographer, when we did the test, he just, he, we went into places like Pigeon Piano, he just went in with his camera at, mid, at 11 o'clock at night and filmed people. And weirdly, people didn't seem to mind too much. As soon as we put a light on, everyone minded and got aggressive. And as soon as we put a microphone out, they, start, they stopped talking and kind of looked around and see why we were listening to their conversation. But just with a camera, weirdly, they didn't mind. So that was the whole principle on which we shot one learned. So that first scene is a bunch of people who are really drunk at five o'clock, uh, uh, 11 o'clock on a Friday night in Soho. And, and, I, and I think it shows, you know, it's like, it does probably is not, it's not like it's important, but it actually kind of is quite important if, you, if everything's wrong in a film and the people in a film, the kind of world of the film is, is given by, by who they are. So you can be in the right bar, but if it's took out on morning on Monday, and it's a bunch of extras being shipped in from Shepparton, it would be, be rubbish in my opinion. So anyway, so that's extras. Uh, music, well, music, music is obviously important. Music is well, incredibly important. On the I Nyman, mean, on the Nyman, though, so if, <coughs> if, if one gets Michael Nyman's score in a Peter Greenaway film, they seem like made for each other in some way, you know, the, 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 the rhythm. The, but what's so interesting about Wonderland is it seems, of, of just to crudely put it, it it's a, a realist drama about things going on in, in London, uh, shot 16 mil, meant to look like... Uh, and then you've got the Nyman score, which which it seems to be in a different register. Yeah, that was deliberate. Um, but um, I mean, it was, it, uh, but what, because it, it goes back to the idea about dialogue. So there was a screenplay, Lawrence Curry again, kind of worked on wrote the screenplay, but it was very much an improvised film. And it was a bunch of characters who I didn't think would want to express to each other uh, what was really kind of on their mind or, or what their real kind of dreams or aspirations would be. It's got a bunch of family members who are more or less disconnected across one weekend in London. And so I think, you know, in a way, if you're not going to use dialogue to, to express what's going on inside someone's head, but you don't want to, I mean, you, it could have just been a, a purely kind of like a kind of observation piece of like from the outside that these, you know, their lives and their struggle to, you know, to, to keep going and, and their connections and so on. But I kind of wanted to feel like that, that I wanted, to, you know, that they, those guys have just as big a dreams and just as big an emotional range uh, as as you know any you know kind of any hero in any film or any character in any books and and, the mu and obviously if you're not going to use dialogue music is one big way you can try and achieve that so for me Nyman's score 
the idea of it was it would give it a kind of epic quality or romantic mm. quality, a kind of, and, and, and in some way be a kind of a version of what their inter, what was going on internally. So it's the kind of in, inside life, the interior life of the characters, as opposed to the exterior life that we see. And there is obviously a gap, but what I kind of hope is that that's the beginning of the film where you feel like, wow, it's a bit of a weird choice of music. And then by the end, actually, you, you are engaged enough with their lives and the, with the detailed lives and their survival that actually then you're really with the music and you really feel that, that you're being emotion, you're, you're, that the emotion of the music is appropriate to, to the, those people and those lives. That, that, well, that is a nice place. That's, not a, that's, <laughs> oh, that's a really ni yeah. nice place to, to end. Um, uh, just uh, a, a, a a few people I want to thank uh, before we give a big thank you to Michael um, who, who've made this uh, who, there are lots of people who've made this event possible today um, but I just want to thank some local people that have done a lot of work one of them is uh, Professor Laura Marcus who's done a lot of things over a week to get Michael here um, and, and to make this work uh, and Becky Roach wherever she is has done so much work and also Robert uh, Rappaport helping us with the uh, with the te technical stuff over uh, both days despite Michael's uh, uh, <laughs> like it. But can we so so can we can we thank them for can we give a round of applause to those people that have made that possible? Um, um, but and, and a very big thank you uh, to Michael uh, uh, for for taking time out of a, a busy, busy schedule. I, we were with him at lunch, and he is just like they say in the Cock and Bull, planning two films ahead. Uh, um, I, I, I really think Michael's put a lot of work in this afternoon. And stay, uh, he said he wasn't going to be able to talk in detail about the film, but you've talked consistently in detail about the film now for two hours, and I'm very grateful. And I hope it was interesting to students here and to the rest of the audience. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.